OK, so let's begin. Um, so today, I will start uh, quantum field theory. And the first part will be kind of informal, just explaining what it's about. And then this, so in the second half, I'll get to perturbative quantum field theory, if I have time. OK, so. OK, so let me first remind you what uh, classical field theory was about. So first of all, we started with a space of fields. Uh, so it was some um, manifold. And it's usually infinite dimensional manifold if your uh, dimension of the space time is greater than zero. So it's usually an infinite dimensional manifold. So the reason it's infinite dimensional is that uh, the space of fields is usually something like a uh, mapping space from the space time into some target. And then if the space time is, um, let's say the target is, is finite dimensional, but the space time has positive dimension, then this mapping space will be infinite dimensional. OK. And the second ingredient in classical field theory is the action functional. OK, it's uh, usually a function from the space of fields into R. But in some examples, like churn simons uh, we discussed that it's a function not into R, but into R mod Z. And similarly, if you have some kind of Wesemina term. OK, so this is what, what's needed to discuss classical field theory. And in quantum field theory, you add one more ingredient. Uh, which is the measure on the space of fields. I'll informally write d phi. OK, so once you have measure, you can talk about um, integrals. So you can discuss the following kind of quantities. So first of all, there is the so-called partition function. So it's the integral over the space of fields with respect to this measure, d phi of um, e to the i times the action functional. Another kind of quantity you can consider is the so-called expectation value. OK, if you have uh, another function, which I'll call script O, on a space of fields, so any such function is called an observable. Then you can, can construct the expectation value. So I'll use the angle brackets for that. So it's given by the integral d phi, the observable of phi, e to the is of phi, 
over the partition function. Okay, and all of quantum field theory is basically about computing these kind of quantities. So the action functional usually depends on some extra parameters like the coupling constant, and then the partition function will be a function of those parameters. Similarly, for expectation values, there will be parameters of the observable and some parameters inside of the action functional. Okay. All right, so um, now you can ask, well, does there exist such a measure, d phi on, on the space of fields? And as a matter of fact, it usually doesn't exist. So let me recall what uh, d phi means in this context. So let's say v is some finite dimensional vector space. Uh, then it has a unique up to a constant uh, translation invariant Borel measure. So Borel measure just means that um, I pick a special sigma algebra, which is the algebra generated by open sets. Translation invariant means that if you look at the measure on some, um, some subset U, then this is the same as the measure on, um, let me call it U upper X, where U upper X is the translate of U with respect to some vector in V. So given a vector, you can translate an open set, and the measure is translation variant. Okay. So in the infinite dimensions, um, such a measure does not exist. Um, so let me state it here. So now let's say V is an infinite dimensional vector space. And I'll put some conditions on the vector space so that it's a, it's a nice kind of uh, infinite dimensional vector space. I'll assume it's a separable, a separable and Bonhoeffer vector space. Okay, um, then the only translation invariant measure on V, which assigns finite values to open sets, is the zero measure. So the, the only thing you can do is you can assign the zero value to every open set. Okay, so this is, this doesn't look so good. Um, you might ask how you can possibly talk about the integrals like this. And there are several ways out of that. Okay, so this partition function doesn't make sense anymore. Because
because the measure doesn't exist. Okay, but there are several ways out of that. Uh, one way um, that we'll talk about is to add a certain uh, parameter in, in, the, in the path integral. Uh, so, so such an integral over the space of fields is usually called the path integral. And I'll keep calling in the path integral. Okay, so the one way out is to replace uh, the z by a function of a certain parameter, h bar. And again, I'm going to write the same expression, but add uh, over h bar an exponent. Now, this expression still doesn't make sense. as a function of h bar. Because again, still the measure doesn't exist. But you could pretend that um, f is a finite dimensional vector space, expand this function into a Taylor series in h bar. So you expand this in the, in the Taylor series and then you just extrapolate um, from the finite dimensional result to the infinite dimensional result. So you, instead of defining z of h bar as a function, you just define some formal power series and say that's the answer. Okay, so this is what, uh, what's called a perturbative quantum field theory. I'll talk about this later today, uh, but before I do that, let me explain another approach to quantum field theory, which is more axiomatic. And it's related to something you might know already, which is uh, the language of topological field theories. Okay, so let, uh, let me remind you some notions from topological field theory. So let's say that M1, M2 are two closed N minus one manifolds. So closed just means compact and having no boundary. Uh, then a cobordism so an n-dimensional cobordism n from m1 to m2. Uh, well, it's a compact and manifold n. So it's compact, but it might have a boundary. 
uh, together with an identification of, the, of its boundary with the disjoint union of M1 and M2. So here I'm not, uh, I haven't put any orientation or any extra structure on the manifold. So that's just what it is. Okay, and then you can talk about uh, coordinates or manifolds equipped with extra structure. So the kind of extra structure might be an orientation Um, so you start with M1, M2, two oriented N minus one manifolds, and then an oriented coordinates between them will be again an oriented N manifold to get an identification of the boundary with slightly different uh, manifolds. So you identify it with M1 bar to turn the union with M2, where M1 bar just means the opposite orientation. So it's one kind of extra structure. Another kind of extra structure you can put is the Riemannian metric. And then, so you start with M1, M2, two Riemannian manifolds, and then you have a Riemannian structure on N, and then you say that this isomorphism is incompatible with the Riemannian metrics. Or you can have some other kind of structure. Okay. Sorry, so does it order to include the data of an identification? Of yes. Yep, exactly. So let, let, let me draw a picture of a coborism. So it's some kind of manifold like this. So here um, you have M1 on one side of the boundary and M2 is given by these two, two circles. So M2 is the disjoint union of two circles and M1 is just a single circle. And the way you should think about this is that there is kind of a time direction and the coordinates allows you to change M1 into M2. Okay. And indeed, it's, it's a very good point that um, here N, N is an abstract manifold and it has abstract manifolds for its boundary and then we want to identify those boundaries with M1. So it's, it's an untrivial type of data. Okay. All right, so now let me give this in a formal definition of a quantum field theory. So a quantum field theory is the following kind of assignment. Okay, so to, to a Riemannian to an oriented Riemannian n minus one manifold, um, to a closed oriented Riemannian manifold, uh, 
um, we assign a vector space. Uh, so let's call this Riemannian manifold M. We assign Z of M, which is a vector space. And this vector space is called uh, the space of states. on the manifold M, or sometimes known as the Hilbert space of the theory, even though I'm not assuming that there is a Hilbert space structure on Z of M. And second type of data is to, to a cobordism. And from M1 to M2, And again, the coborism carries an orientation in a Riemannian structure. You assign Z of N, which is a linear map from Z of M1 to Z of M2. So Z of M1 and Z of M2 are two vector spaces, and you attach a linear map um, from, the, from Z of M1 to Z of M2. Okay, and, th and then there are several axioms, and I'm going to write only a few of them that will be important for me. Okay, so the first axiom is what happens if you plug in the empty n minus one manifold. So you can regard the empty set as either an n minus one manifold or an n manifold as a cobordism. So here I regard it as an n minus one manifold. Um, I haven't said that, uh, what, what, what are these vector spaces over, and I'll assume that these are complex vector spaces. And this is going to be a C linear map. Okay, so then uh, this vector space that you attach to the empty manifold is the triple one dimensional vector space, just C itself. Uh, the second axiom is if you have a disjoint union of two manifolds, and here I'm assuming that there are n minus one manifolds, so you're, you're supposed to attach a vector space to that, and the vector space you get um, is obtained from the vector space for each m1 and m2. just by looking at the tensor product of those. And the final exam that I'm going to write down is what happens when you compose cobordisms. So let's say N is a cobordism from M1 to M2, N prime is a cobordism from M2 to M3. Okay, you can, uh, you can write the composition of those two. So by definition, this composition is given by taking N, discerning union with N prime, and gluing them along the boundary, which is M2. So the picture is that, uh, let's say you have M1, let's say you have N, the coordinates as before, 
So this is my n. This is m1. This is m2. And then you have um, another coordinism. to m3. So this is going to be n prime. Um, OK, let's try it, try it like this. OK, let, let me first draw it separately. So this is going to be this is n, this is n prime, and their their composite is going to be the following kind of manifold. So this is n composed with n prime. So here, the boundaries are still m1 and m3, m1, m2, m2, m3. OK, so if you take these two manifolds and glue them together along these two circles, you're going to get um, this kind of genus 1 surface. OK, uh, so this is the composite uh, cobordism. And just by construction, is going to be coordinate from M1 to M3. And the axiom, the third axiom of a quantum field theory is that the value on the composite is given by the value on the prime composed with the value on N. So what does this mean? Um, you start with z of m1, you go to z of m2, and then to z of m3. Here you use z of n. Here you use z of n prime. And the composite is z of n prime composed with n. OK. Have you seen these kind of axioms before? OK. OK, so let me give uh, one consequence of the axioms. So let's say you look at n, which is a closed n-manifold. So a closed n-manifold is an example of a, of a cobordism. It's a cobordism from the empty n minus 1 manifold to the empty n minus 1 manifold. So again, what is a cobordism? It's a compact n-manifold with an identification of the boundary with disjoint union of the two manifolds. Now the boundary is empty, and the disjoint union of two empty sets is empty. OK, so this is indeed the cobordism. So uh, by definition, z of n is going to be a linear map from z of the empty set to z of the empty set. By the first axiom, z of the empty set is c. And similarly for the target. So you get a linear map from c to c. 
So how do you specify such a linear map from C to C? Yeah, so it's just, just given by a number, which is the value of, let's say, one under this map. And this number is exactly the partition function. Okay. Now, in general, it's difficult to construct uh, quantum field theories in this framework. And usually you make some simplifications. So some simplifications can be an assumption that the value of this assignment doesn't depend on the Riemannian structure, let's say. So one example would be a topological quantum field theory. So it's a kind of quantum field theory where this assignment just does not depend on the metric. And there are several examples of axiomatic quantum field theories which are topological. And another example of quantum field theory that has been constructed is a conformal field theory. Uh, in this case, um, th this value, this assignment depends on the metric but in a certain weak sense. So it depends only on the conformal class of the metric. And the conformal class of the metric is just a class, um, is an equivalence class under transformations where you take the metric let's say gij, and you multiply it by a function. So you take all components and you mul multiply them by the same function. Uh, this defines you some group action on the space of metrics, and the equivalence class under this group action is a conformal class of the metric. So in this case, if, um, if Z only depends on conformal class, it's called conform field theory. And again, there are examples of those. Okay, so let me give you another example of an axiomatic quantum field theory. And in this example, I'll assume that the dimension of the quantum field theory is one. Then there's a nice example. So the claim is that quantum mechanics is an example of axiomatic quantum field theory.
So what I mean by this, so let's say you have some H, uh, it's a Hilbert space, and you have some Hamiltonian on this Hilbert space. And I will not uh, put any functional theoretic assumptions on the Hamiltonian. So we'll ignore some technical issues. Okay, then how do you construct out of this data uh, an axiomatic quantum field theory? So let's begin with zero manifolds. So what's a, what's a closed zero manifold? So what kind of closed zero manifolds do you know? Any examples? A point. Okay, a point. Any other examples do you know? Two points. Two points. Okay, great. Uh, so, so, so as a closed zero manifold, it's the same as a finite collection of points. Finite determinant union of points. It's a fine. It's finite because uh, I'm assuming that the manifold is compact. Okay. So what, what's a Riemannian structure on a point? What's a metric on a point? Okay. Riemannian structure on a point is just nothing. It doesn't give you any information. Every point automatically has a unique Riemannian metric. Just because the tangent space is zero-dimensional, there is nothing to pair. Okay, what about orientations? How many orientations are there on a point? Okay, so there are two orientations on a point. You're trying to orient the zero, you're trying to, okay. Um, We call them plus and minus. So the, the idea is that what's an orientation? So it's, a, it's an orientation of the determinant of the tangent bundle. Well, the tangent bundle is the zero bundle. So the determinant of the zero tangent of the zero bundle is just R, and you're trying to orient a one-dimensional vector space. And the orientation of one-dimensional vector space is exactly a choice of the direction. So it's either plus or minus. Okay, so now what I'm going to assume is that my theory is actually independent of the orientation, but it depends on the Riemannian metric. So Z of the point, I'll just say this is the Hilbert space. Okay, and if you like, z of either orientation on the, on the point is, this, is the Hilbert space. Okay, so now let's move on to coordinates. Okay, so the next question is what kind of compact one manifolds do you know? Pardon me? Uh, no, just, just like any one manifold, compact one manifold, you know? Okay, so, so there, there are intervals and there are circles and that's, that's it. So a compact one manifold so it's a finite determinant union of intervals and circles. Okay, so by, uh, by one of the axioms, 
that I think I have not written down, uh, it's enough to specify the value on just the, the value on, on the disjoint unit of manifolds is going to be just the product of values on each manifold. So it's enough to specify the value on the interval and on the circle. Okay, so what, what are Riemannian structures on the interval? How do you specify a metric on the interval? And here I'm looking at the Riemannian structure up to a diffeomorphism. How, how do you specify a Riemannian structure on, a, on, on the interval up to a diffeomorphism? Like yes, yeah, so, so the length is the unique invariant um, of Riemannian, or Riemannian metric on the one manifold. And so the question is, what do you attach to the interval of length t? Well, by definition, this is going to be a map from uh, the Hilbert space to the Hilbert space. And I'm going to let this map be the evolution operator, which I'll write as e to the i t h, where h is the Hamiltonian. So this evolution operator defines you some map from h to h, which depends on t. And then it's easy to see the composite of two intervals will give you um, the composition of evolution operators. So this is uh, going to satisfy the axioms. And now on the circle, again, um, again, uh, Riemannian structure on the circle is specified by giving the length of the circle. So by definition, this is going to be a map from Z of the empty manifold, empty zero manifold to the Z of the empty zero manifold. Which is C, which is C, so it's a number. And this number is going to be the trace of ith, where h, sorry, where t is the length of the circle. Okay, and again, uh, this, is going to be, this is going to satisfy the axioms. So you have to check that if you take two intervals and you glue them together, you can get a circle. And so you need to check that axiom and this is still going to be satisfied. Okay, so I haven't specified some other coordinates. You can view the interval, not as a coordinate from a point to a point, but as a coordinate from two points to the empty set. So you can also specify like this, um, but I will just leave it to you. So this is going to be a map from H tensor H to C, which is essentially the same as a map from H to H. And that map is again going to be e to the i t h. Okay, so this gives you a nice example of one-dimensional quantum field theory, uh, which depends on the Riemannian metric. And as I said, there are many examples of topological quantum field theories in higher dimensions. Okay, uh, so let's take a break. And after the break, I'll talk about perturbative quantum field theory.
Okay, so let's continue. So before the break, uh, I was discussing an axiomatic approach to quantum field theory. And as I said, there are, there are some examples of those axiomatic quantum field theories, but it's in general difficult to construct those. But there's another approach to quantum field theory, which is perturbative quantum field theory, which is what I'm going to start right now. And in, in this approach, pretty much every quantum field theory is defined. So this is what we're going to discuss. Okay, so, so what's the idea? I already mentioned that we're interested in the integrals which depend on h bar. Let's say we have some observable. Oh, phi. And then e to the uh, i s of phi over h bar, and I'm going to expand this into Taylor series. So this has an asymptotic expansion. I'm, I'm going to explain what this uh, sentence means. Okay, so let's, uh, let, let's talk about the case when f is just finite dimensional vector space. So let me fix some notation. Um, yeah. Okay, so before I do that, let me still keep talking about the general setting. Sorry, oh, sorry. Isn't there no, isn't that O term not there? Isn't this the expectation value? And like, oh, uh, <laughs> no. Okay, let me maybe call it I. But yeah, we're interested in integrals of, the, of this kind. And then the expectation value would be i of h bar mod the partition, partition function where you, ha you have no O. And then the partition function itself would be when O is one. But basically the main ingredient is computing these kind of integrals. Okay, so, so again, I'm still going to be informal, then I'll state the precise theorem allowing me to do the following thing. So let's say phi naught, <coughs> is a critical point of the action functional. So what does it mean for this to be a critical point? That means that if you say, if you say phi is phi naught plus um, a small correction, and I'm going to write the small correction as square root of h bar times delta phi, then I, I can expand this S of phi into, into Taylor series. It's going to be S of phi naught. Uh, then you're going to write the derivative uh, of S evaluate on phi naught. Because phi naught is a critical point, that term goes away. So there is no linear term, there is a quadratic term. and then times h bar delta t squared and plus some higher terms. Okay, so you can expand the action function like this. Okay, so the, ne the next thing, um, so the idea is to change the variable of integration from phi to delta phi. So now I'm going to just look at the integrals in terms of delta phi. Okay, so then this integral is going to be um, O of phi naught plus h bar, square root of h bar delta phi e to the s phi naught over h bar. Uh, the next term is going to be i d squared s d phi squared values on phi naught. Um, 
delta phi squared and plus some higher terms. Okay, so I've just rewritten the action fun the I've substituted here the Taylor series for the action functional. Uh, note that you have one over h bar, and then in the Taylor series for the action functional, there's there is an extra h bar. So the very first term has one over h bar, the quadratic term has no h bar, then the higher terms will have some positive power of h bar. Dp. Now, um, you can write d phi as h bar to the n over 2 d delta phi, where n is the dimension of the space of fields. So this is how the measure changes, because this is just a linear change of variables. OK, and then. Um, then I'm, I'm going to do the following. I'm going to expand uh, my observable into Taylor series. And I'm going to expand the exponent into Taylor series where I just expand the rest and I keep that. So it's going to be a sum of integrals of the form like the following. So there's going to be delta phi to some power, let's call it m. Then there's going to be e to the i s of phi naught over h bar, and then plus i del squared s d phi squared phi naught delta phi squared d delta phi. OK, so again, I expand everything else. This, may, this will give me some power of delta phi. The Taylor series here will also give me some power of delta phi. So I get, I get some power of delta phi, and I get that uh, in the exponent. Now, this coefficient is independent of delta phi, so it's, it's just a prefactor. So, so this kind of computation of the integral boils down to computing Gaussian type integrals. So let me just uh, do the one dimensional case. Um, And then I lambda x squared dx. So once you know how to compute these kind of integrals, this procedure will tell you how to expand an arbitrary integral into Taylor series, and you can compute the coefficients of this Taylor series, again, in terms of the Gaussian type integrals. OK, so let me give uh, more precise theorems about this procedure. So it was ex quite informal about expanding the exponent into Taylor series and so on. So how does this actually work? Okay, so, so first of all, uh, let me start. I'll say two theorems. Um, the only difference between the two theorems will be whether you look at um, exponents with imaginary unity in the exponent or nicer integrals um, where you just have ordinary Gaussian integrals. So if you didn't have an i there, you would compute integrals of this form. And I'll st state two theorems, one about integrals of this kind and one about integrals of this kind. OK, let me start with the first kind. So the first theorem is called the stationary phase of, uh, sorry, uh, it's called the me method of sequence descent.
Okay, so here uh, you're looking at the integrals of this form. Let's call it d phi, g of phi, i s of phi, over each bar, integral over d, and d is going to be some subset of Rn, which is compact. H bar again. Okay, so when we want to understand these kind of integrals for H bar small, so let me make the following assumptions. So S is a function from D to R. Satisfying some axioms. So, first of all, S is smooth. Uh, S admits a global unit, so admits a unique global minimum. some point phi equals to c. And I'll assume that this is an interior of d. So d minus this boundary. And finally, uh, I'll assume that this matrix of second derivatives evaluated at c is positive. So what does it mean? Uh, this matrix is a symmetric matrix. So you can look at these eigenvalues. And all of its eigenvalues are positive. Um, and one more correction. There is a, not an i, but a minus here. Okay, so uh, that's the assumption on S and the assumptions on G. Uh, it's just that it's smooth. Okay, so then the claim is that this integral I of H bar Uh, can be computed by this procedure that I've just explained. So you can change the variable from phi to delta phi. When you change the variable, you pick up h to the n over 2, where n is the dimension of d. Next, you're going to pick up e to the minus s of c over h bar. So now you expand. Um, phi is c plus some small correction, sorry, square root of h bar delta phi. So that's the second term you pick up. And then you have some Taylor series. You have alpha of h bar. Where alpha is a smooth function. Okay, so this, this tells you that, um, okay, you can do this expansion. Sorry, uh, you, can, you can rewrite your integral in this way, where alpha is going to be a smooth function. And if you have a smooth function, you can write its Taylor series. And this is what we're, we're going to take as uh, our definition of the perturbative expansion of the integral. So it's a smooth function satisfying the following condition. Alpha not alpha of zero um, I cannot 
fit it here. So I just put it here. So it's going to be 2 pi to the n over 2 g of c over square root of the determinant. OK, so let, let, me, let me explain this again. You, you start with the integral. Informally speaking, you do this change of variables. So you arrive at the integral for alpha in terms of delta phi. The integral for alpha can be computed by expanding it into Taylor series. The zeroth term is given by some Gaussian integral, which gives you that. And then you have some higher, some higher terms in the Taylor series for alpha. OK, so for this to be well-defined, uh, let me observe that here we have determined of this matrix, the matrix of second derivatives. So here, S double prime of C is exactly this matrix. And then because this matrix is positive, it's determined as positive as well. So you can take a square root. OK, so that's, uh, that's the first theorem. Now let me talk about the case where you have an I in here. So it's the second theorem. And this is called the stationary phase approximation. So in this case, you study integrals, as I said in the very beginning, um, so you have d phi, g of phi, p to the i s over h bar. So you make the following assumptions on s, and d is still a compact subset. Um, so again, I'm going to assume that S is smooth. S has a unique critical point. Again, in the interior of D. So here, I'm assuming that S has a unique critical point here, I assume that it has a unique global minimum. So that's the, the main difference. And finally, uh, I'll assume that the, the matrix of second derivatives, so I'm not assuming that it's positive, but I assume that it's not degenerate. Which means the determinant is not zero. OK. So then the conclusion is as before. Yeah. Uh, and G, well, yeah, smooth. Um, Ah, yeah, there's one more assumption on G. Uh, let me just try that. G is smooth. Um, and G restricted to the, to the boundary of D and all these derivatives vanish. Uh, 
Okay, so then the conclusion is the following. Okay, so this is going to be still h to the n over 2 e to the i s of c over h bar times alpha of h bar where alpha is again smooth. Um, it's complex valued. Um, and its value is going to be 2 pi to the n over 2 exponent of pi i sigma over 4. I'll explain what sigma is in a second. G of c over square root of the absolute value of the determinant. OK, again, the, the main statement of the theorem is that alpha becomes a smooth function on uh, 0 to infinity. And its value is, again, given by a Gaussian integral. So here, as the, the se this matrix of second derivatives at a critical point is assumed to be non degenerate so the determinant is non-zero, but it, it might be negative, or it might take arbitrary value. So I put an absolute value here. And here is sigma is the so-called signature of this, this matrix. Um, which, is, um, which is the number of positive eigenvalues minus the number of negative eigenvalues. OK. Yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, okay, so I'm not going to explain uh, how you actually prove these theorems. Th this is in the realm of analysis. Let me just explain how you get these values. So in both cases, we need to compute some Gaussian integrals. OK, so in the first case, have to compute integral of this form e to the minus lambda x squared dx where lambda is positive. So this positivity assumption is exactly the assumption that uh, the matrix of second derivative is positive. Then you can diagonalize it and then you split it into single integrals of this form and this integral is equal to something. OK, so this integral is equal to a square root of pi or a lambda. So this is going to give you the, this pi, um, square root of pi to, to the n. And then the lambdas are the eigenvalues. And together, they combine into the square root of the determinant. So this is where the square root of the determinant of s, dot, of the second derivatives of s at c appear. OK, and then for, for stationary phase, you do the same. And 
and instead you have this integral um, e to the i lambda x squared dx. And then depending on whether lambda is positive or negative, there are, there are two answers. Okay, so here the answer is going to be um, e to the pi i over four, square root of pi, or wraps of beta, pi or wraps of value of lambda, and here is going to be minus pi i over four, the same expression. This is if lambda is positive, this is if lambda is negative. Okay, so you can compute these integrals, and again, you compute it for each eigenvalue, and then you take the product over all of them. So these combine into the absolute value of the determinant, and then this exponents for each positive eigenvalue you have a plus, for each negative eigenvalue you have a minus, and this combines to the signature. So this is how you obtain this um, expression for alpha, alpha, of, alpha of zero. Okay. A any questions about either of the theorems? Yes, what happens if the global minimum or the critical point is not unique? It's, 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 not, it's not unique. Or it's not unique. Is that unique? Yeah, so, so then, um, then there, there are, it's going to be a sum over all, let, let's say there are, there are finitely many of those and they're isolated. Then there's going to be a sum over each critical point of similar kind of expressions. And then for each critical point, you have an alpha. And then usually you're interested in um, asymptotic expansions. So only some of the exponents uh, matter because these exponents will dominate some other exponent. So that's, that's what usually happens. And so similarly for Stevie's descent, again, you, you'll have, you have a sum over each critical point for, of, of this kind of expression. And then again, you'll have exponents, some exponents that dominate some other exponents. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so let, let me give you some examples. Um, yeah, so b before I talk about the example, uh, let me just explain this word, uh, asymptotic expansion. Okay, so, so since alpha is smooth, it has a Taylor series. Which is just, as you all know, this is nth derivative of alpha at the origin times h bar to the n over n factorial. Uh, but in general, even if alpha is smooth, this series will not approximate um, the function itself. So the function might not be, so even though it's smooth, it might not be analytic. series will not converge to alpha in a neighborhood of h bar equals to zero. So the series will usually have the zero radius of convergence. A, something called asymptotic series. So let me explain this. So um, I will write this, this symbol alpha of h bar is approximated by some 
some series. Um, so this is called an asymptotic expansion. For his function alpha. So again, you start with the function alpha and you approximate it by some series. And maybe I'll also write is approximated as h bar goes to zero. Uh, if the following condition is satisfied, okay, so, so the difference of alpha of h bar and some, it's O of h to the capital N, which is the next term. So it's approximated up to the next term. So even though this is, uh, you have this estimate, it does not apply to the series converters to alpha. In any neighborhood of, well, at h bar equals to zero, this is definitely true, but in any finite neighborhood of h bar equals to zero, it might not converge. Okay, so let me give an example where this happens. The expectation is that this always happens, actually. So let me look at the following example. Have I, I of h bar. Um, d phi e to the minus phi squared plus phi to the fourth over h bar. Okay, so here g of phi is one and s of phi is phi squared plus phi to the fourth. Okay, so here um, the integral is over some infinite, uh, it's, it's over a non-compact set, but it doesn't matter. Um, I'll just ignore it for now. So let's try to apply the method of steepest descent So what does it mean? It means that uh, we need to find all minima of, uh, of S. Well, this is, this is obvious in this case, S is positive. Sorry, it's not negative. And the only minimum is at phi equals to zero. Okay, so that's, that's my C. Okay, and then um, I change the coordinates from phi to some new coordinate. Uh, instead of calling the delta phi, I'll just call it x. So square root of h bar times x. <coughs> So what happens to the integral? First of all, from the measure, you pick up h bar to the 1 half. dx. Now you'll have phi squared over h bar. Phi squared over h bar is exactly x squared. And then you have phi to the fourth over h bar. That's going to be minus h bar x to the fourth. So you get this kind of integral. Okay, now uh, this is exactly my alpha. So, 
So by the theorem, it's, it's smooth, and it can differentiate with respect to the parameter h bar. So to find the Taylor series for alpha, I just have to expand this expression into Taylor series in h bar. So let's see what happens. So I'll have e to the minus x squared. Then I'll have a sum minus 1 to the n, h bar to the n, x to the 4n, and factorial. So just expand it to e to the h bar x to the fourth into your Taylor series. OK, so then you get uh, h to the 1 half. And then the sum over what uh, minus 1 to the n, h bar to the n, n factorial, integral gx e to the minus x squared, x to the 4n. OK, so you have to compute this integral now. Um, I'll have to look it up. So, uh, just one small correction. Uh, let, me, let me put an extra two. It doesn't really matter. It's an overall factor. Um, what it will change? We'll put a half here, half here. It'll put a half here, and then it will put a two to the end here, to the end here, half here. Okay, so, so you need to compute that interval instead. Just have a formula for that. Uh, okay, so then you get that this integral is approximated by h bar to the one half, the sum minus 1 to the n, h bar to the n, 4n factorial, then 2 to the 3n, 2n factorial, n factorial. OK. So this is what happens when you just compute this Gaussian integral. So in your homework, you, you were asked to compute this sort of integral, and then out of that kind of integral, you could also compute uh, Gaussian integral with some insertion of a function. Okay, so th then you get this answer. Now, what's, what's the radius of convergence of the series? Does the series converge in any neighborhood of h bar? H how do you estimate that? H how do you compute the radius of convergence of any kind of series like that? Yeah, okay, so there are, there are several ways you can do that. There is thing called ratio test. We can do that. Uh, any other suggestions? So, so, so there, there are basically two ways to compute the radius of convergence. There is the ratio test, and there is the, something called the root test. Um, maybe let, it's a little bit easier in this case to, get, to use the root test. Um, Anyway, so, so let me just say alpha n is the coefficient minus 1 to the n for n factorial 2 to the 3n to n factorial n factorial. And the radius of convergence
is given by limit as n goes to infinity nth root of alpha n and probably want to do one over n. So, that, so there's a formula of that kind. Or you can also compute the ratios, um, limit of the ratios that, that also works. Anyway, so, so let's, let's try to compute that. In this case, okay, so minus one to the n doesn't matter. Let's deal with, with 4n factorial. So let me recall another thing. By the Stirling formula, n factorial has the following uh, kind of asymptotics as n goes to infinity. Square root of two pi n n over e to the n, and then some other series. Okay, so this is called the Stirling's formula. So let's apply this Turing approximation to the factorial. Okay, then you see that alpha n goes something like this. It has 4n to the 4n. Then there's going to be 2 to the 3n, um, 2n to the 2n, and then n to the n. So let me ignore the exponential factors. Let's just look at um, things that go faster than the exponential. So here we have n to the 4n, we have n to the 2n, and n to the n. So this goes like n to the n. Okay, so there, therefore, this goes to infinity. So the nth root of alpha n goes like n, so the limit is infinite, and so the, therefore the radius is just zero. So the series uh, does not converge in any neighborhood of zero, but it is an asymptotic series. So let me stop here, and then in the next lecture, Anton will talk about uh, ways of computing this, this sort of integrals by some combinatorics.